We're here this evening with Tom Campbell, author of My Big Toe. Tom, your My Big Toe, or Big Theory of Everything, encompasses every aspect of our reality. And tonight's subject, we're going to discuss something you thought was important for psychics and mediums to understand and to help evolve their gifts. You have said there is no difference between the database and the messages received by the mediums or psychics. Um, how can your My Big Toe viewpoint help mediums and psychics evolve their gifts? We have a couple of comments and questions from some very prominent uh, psychics around the country and from Canada. Uh, Marla Fries is a transformational uh, intuitive and psychic and she's had some questions for you as far as how her process works. How can she tap into the memories of the past in the now? She asks, is it happening all at one time? She was asked to do a, or to, she was asked to assist with a murder and she was given a certain amount of information, but she had to blindly tap into just an area, then connect to the victim, and then connect to those memories. Now Marla uses um, emotional information. She doesn't disagree with you that the database, your scientific viewpoint, is how the information is, is equal to her information. Mm -hmm. Um, how would you answer that question and um, help answer our question, our theme tonight of how we can help evolve the psychics and mediums' gifts? Okay. Well, there are people who, for one reason or another, uh, have a very, um, a very good ability, a very refined ability, to collect information from the larger consciousness system, from the databases, uh, both future and past, and to intuitively gather uh, the information they, they need to gather, you know, and they are accurate most of the time. So what I might bring to such persons that are, that are skilled like this, and Marla certainly is one very skilled uh, intuitive as an understanding of just what's happening you know, what are the mechanics what's working and if you understand what's working then it should enable you to more effectively uh, understand the, the kind of data you get and to get the data with uh, the least amount of, of ritual or process such that it, uh, you maybe have some unnecessary steps you could skip or you uh, may be able to actually do better with a more precise intent if you understand the relationship between intent and the information you get. So it would just, you know, you always can do better at anything if you really know what's going on. You can, you can, uh, you know, you can get more out of your computer. <laughs> you know how to operate your computer and you know how to operate the software. You can just make it do more than if you don't know much about it and you just, uh, you know, kind of constrained to the to the few things that you do know that you've worked and come across by well not sort of by accident but by practice there's uh, maybe other ways that you could approach problems and other sorts of data you could get that you don't even know is out there because you've just never tried to get it so it's a it's a way of hopefully this little little uh, interview will uh, help these people find a bigger picture so that they can uh, like you say, evolve the kind of work that they do. Because the, the My Big Toe does, theory does support people being able to do this. And a point to make is that everybody can do this, not just these few uh, sensitive intuitives, such as Marla, but this is possible for everyone. You can do this because you are consciousness. You're the, you're the player. Okay, in this virtual reality game, and because you're the player, 
you could learn to do this. And with practice, you could get good at it. Now, these folks are very good at it. One, because they've practiced. They've worked on it, uh, most of them probably, from a very young age, um, where they tapped into things and then they've been working on it, refining it and gaining confidence in it and seeing what works and what doesn't and going with what works and dropping what doesn't. That means evolving, you know, the, the uh, ability for them to uh, get accurate information. And they've probably been doing this for decades. Most of them would probably be multiple decades they've been doing this. So it isn't something that everybody can just do because they want to, but it's like, uh, you know, being good at playing the piano. Everybody can do it, but most people don't because they don't take the time and the effort and the energy to do it. But if you worked at playing the piano for two decades, you'd probably be pretty good at it, particularly if you worked at it every day. And these intuitives work at it every day. It's something they do all the time. So you do something all the time like that, and if you're serious and put effort into it, then you should get good at it, and you can. Um, so that's kind of how I hope I can be of help to them, since they uh, asked the question, you know, what is it that I might be able to tell them, and how might I help them get a bigger picture such that they could improve their processes, and maybe do them faster, or maybe do them more accurately, or, or see what the active ingredients is, so at least they could uh, knowingly uh, uh, you know, improve the processes they have. Now, let me make a, another statement about processes. Many people have their own processes that they've developed over a long time. These processes work for them. These processes mostly boil down to um, rituals, if you will, ways they go about doing things, the steps they go through. Uh, a lot of people in meditation have processes. Sometimes the processes are very elaborate, you know, with their mantras or their visualization or their incense or their, you know, their music. And it, they have uh, this whole set of habits, which I'm calling ritual, that they that they learn to do. And, and if, you, if you learn something and have habits like that, it's not that there's anything wrong with that. We need process. In order to do things consistently it requires consistent process. So you can't just haphazardly start something and, and expect to get consistency. So consistent processes are good and, and everybody uh, should optimize their own processes. And what works for one person as a really good process won't necessarily work for another person because the process is a tool to help you focus your intent precisely on what your information needs are, on what your questions are, what information you're trying to get to. So um, don't have the idea that the process or the rituals or the habits that you use are wrong and you should you know, not use those because they're not fundamental. Well, they're not fundamental, but it's your way of doing it. And you may be, well, you certainly will be more comfortable doing it that way and doing it any different way, coming up with a, um, a better process may be difficult. And if you change the process too radically, it may not work for a while. Just like if you learn to meditate lying down, and then you decide you're going to sit up in a chair and meditate, and you just can't meditate sitting up because nothing feels right. Well, that's the way it is when you alter your process. That doesn't mean there's anything fundamental about uh, meditating lying down or meditating sitting up. It really doesn't make any difference. But you get habituated to a process, and doing anything else other than that process seems it makes it impossible. I, I hear that a lot. I just can't meditate in you know, such and such an environment. I can't meditate sitting up. So that's the, that's the idea. Well, I think it's, it's good that people have their own individual processes. You've always said to develop your own way mm -hmm. to do things, whether that is to meditate, to tap into information, or to heal. But, and I think um, Marla understands her her particular process, she had a particular question about 
since we're doing this from your scientific view, one of her questions was, um, how can she, she can tap into the memories that have happened in the past in the now. She wants to know, is it happening all at one time? How could she go, for instance, if she were um, tapping into, say someone asked her, some law enforcement agency asked her to help with a murder without any information, perhaps just the description of what happened, maybe a name, something that would uh, get her focused. How could she go to an area, then connect to the victim in the present? Mm -hmm. Those were, those were some yeah, the, of the time, questions. Yeah, the time thing is, is confusing. And I hear this a lot about there is no time. Time is an illusion. The past, the present, and the future all happen simultaneously. Time is fundamental. It's not only not an illusion, it's very real. It's a fundamental part of consciousness. There's a few things you need to have before you can have consciousness as we understand it. Um, the things fundamental to it that are logically necessary for consciousness you know, would be things like memory, you know, processing capability, but also time. You see, change. Memory, just the idea of memory implies change because you add new things to memory. Well, if you're going to have a before state and an after state, here's what my memory has in it now, here's what it has in it you know, later, now that's time. You've defined time, the difference uh, between a before and after state. If there is no time, then there can be no learning. There can be no experience, because an experience happens now, and then a little different now, and then a little different later. You see, experience is something that changes in time. So time is is fundamental. You can't have consciousness without free will either. Free will is fundamental to consciousness. Without uh, free will then there's nothing for consciousness to do or be. There's just uh, a, a deterministic script that has no purpose, no point, and nothing really happens. You see it's dead. It, it, it can't evolve. It can't do anything. Evolution requires time. Change requires time. So without time, nothing changes. Everything just is and stays that way in a static state, period. Nothing happens. You can't have thoughts without time. You see, time, uh, if you don't have free will, you can't make choices. There are no choices. Free will is what you're talking about, a choice. You make a choice, and if it's a real choice, then it's because you have the freedom to choose between A or B. You could do either one, and you pick one. If you don't have that choice, then consciousness is undefined. What does it mean to be conscious when there are no choices? You see, it means nothing. Consciousness only is something of value or something that, it, that can exist if you have choices, if you have free choices. If all your choices are pre-programmed, then there are no choices, then you're not conscious. You're just a, you know, a machine running through the inevitable. You see, there is no consciousness. So, and a few basic things that are required for consciousness, and time is one of them. And there is a past, a present, and a future. And those things aren't all happening at once. That makes no sense. That's illogical. The past is past. It's what we've done because we have time and we have choices because we are conscious and there are those things that we are going to do which is uh, lies in the future and in the act of doing, in the act of thinking the choice itself, the act of choosing happens in the present. So you see all the all the action is in the present. The past is simply a record. It's the past, it's the data it's, it's the actions with, that we took earlier. So the past is just a, it, it's, it's a, it's a database. And the future is probabilistic. There's a probable future because the future 
the probability of the future depends on the choices we make now. So we make certain set of choices in the present, the probabilities in the future are different because of those choices we made. We choose to do this instead of that, and now our whole set of interactions changes because now it has to go down the path where we did this instead of that. So it's a different set of challenges, a different set of choices. So the future is just probabilistic. Our intent modifies future probability. That's part of the feedback system of the, of the consciousness system. It has this feedback in this learning lab to allow us to, to learn. We get to see the consequences of our intents. And that seeing the consequences is a good school, right? You don't have a very good school if you just do things and you never know, you know, whether you got it right or got it wrong or how, what the effect was or what happened because of it. If you don't get any of that, then it's not a very good school. So we have this ability to, in this particular uh, respect, to create our own reality and that we modify future probability with our intent. So the things that happen, the, 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 the opportunities that come to us uh, in the future are often uh, nudged or, or are, uh, you know, I won't say invented or created, but at least they're nudged. The probabilities are, are nudged up or nudged down based on our intent. So the future now is biased toward our intentions. We get what we intend to get. Okay, so that uh, makes us kind of co-creator, if you will, in this, and it's a good feedback system. Okay, now Marla has a process where the first thing, if somebody puts her on a, a murder case, okay, they want to know who did it, or where they are, or that sort of thing. So the first thing that, that uh, she wants to do is identify with the murder, to identify with the murder victim and the murder, the act itself, so that she can kind of place her mindset in that, in that happening. And she does that by finding a place. Where's the place? So she sees a map. And then that map, she focuses down to where she feels comfortable. Okay, this was the place. Now that kind of connects her with this particular event, this murder event. This is the place where this event took place. And this event took place because Susie Q, you know, was murdered here, or Joe Blow was murdered here. And that kind of fix the, the scene, if you will. The scene of the crime is where the detective always starts, right? So it just makes sense that if you're going to play detective, you'd want to start with the scene of the crime. Okay, so that's where she starts. And after she gets to the scene of the crime, then she can start unraveling what went on there. You know, she can start unraveling the story that led up to this, this scene and then unravel perhaps, you know, the probabilities of what might happen, you know, in the future. So all of that database, all those databases, the probable future and the past are available to her. And because she's practiced this for decades and decades, she knows how to get that data. And she has a process and the process starts with the scene of the crime just because that's the way people think about a process of being a detective. You start with the scene of the crime. So anyway, um, there is a past, there is a future, and action happens in the present. And, and Marla has this, this sequence of the way she approaches the problem. That sequence is what I call a tool set. These are tools that she's developed. There isn't really any fundamental need to first find a place. That's not really required. But she does it because that's the way she does it. That's the way she's used to doing it, so that's her process. And if she tried it some other way, it probably wouldn't work as well for a while until she built up some practice and some time and confidence in a new process. So if the process works for you, then I, you know, if the tool set works for you, then don't, don't change it unless you find some reason why you think you could improve it or make it better or get better answers and, you know, whatever. So that's, 
I don't mean to imply that uh, you know everybody should get rid of their tool sets for a minimum set, so they have the minimum steps to get to where they want to go. That's not really the point. You, the tool set's there because people need it and people use it, and it's habit. It's, it's habitual. So no, in a in a uh, you know, had she thought about this differently and practiced differently, she could uh, have skipped the first step which is go to the scene of the crime, find the place. Um, that's not necessary if what she's trying to do is unravel the story of what led to that. Okay, if that's her goal is to go to that story, then she doesn't, know to, she doesn't have to go to the place. If it's her goal to find out what happened afterwards, in other words, let's say it's a kidnapping, you might want to go to the scene of the crime of the kidnapping, but you want to go forward from the kidnapping which was the scene of the crime, to, well, where are they now? You see, you want to move that direction. Well, then going to the place would be a good idea because that's where you're going to start your trail leading to where they are now. You might as well start at the one place where you know it all started. You see, so in that case, going to the place would be a very rational thing to do. If what you're trying to do is just uh, discover um, what happened, in the murder, say, who did what and where did the, you know, where did the killer come from and what was his motivations and what was her feelings and all that sort of thing. If you're trying to build the story, then the place really isn't that important to that story. So it depends on what you want, how you approach the problem. And every one, every case is going to be different. So you can approach it from, you can adjust your tool set to match what it is you need to do. Well, could we say that to, to highlight further this idea of time, she's going back in time, she might go forward in time for some, for some particular reason. Would you say that consciousness and intent is what gathers the information, not the time? The time is, not that it's happening all at once, but it's irrelevant, it's simply information that's stored. Would you say intent is what gathers yeah, the information? Yeah, intent is what gathers the information. But what you do, and it depends again on how you want to um, work with your tools, how you want to focus your intent. So let's say you want to go and, and look at maybe the, the uh, hour before the crime occurred. Well, that's kind of specific place in time. You could roll backwards, start at one hour. You could have an intent. Okay, here's the crime I'm interested in. That gives you a, a, an address, if you will, being able to specify the crime you're interested in. Okay, this was a crime that Detective so-and-so told me about. Now, Detective so-and-so didn't have to give you a name or a location or anything about it. You can just say, I intend to go collect data that Detective so-and-so told me about, that, that crime. Now, the detective knows what crime he told you about, and he knows some of the details of it, so that automatically will set you with that crime. But now if what you've done is in the past is to say, well, I need a name. Well, I need a piece of their clothing. I need a piece of their hair. I need a picture. You see, you can have all these things you need, but these are just habitual tools that you use that help you focus, but they're not necessary. All you have to say, you don't even need to know what the person's name is. You can just identify them in some unique way. Once they're identified in a unique way, then you have a tent, an intent that might say, I want to go back, you know, an hour before, or you may even intend to just start at the pre at, at when the at the scene of the crime when the crime occurred, and just kind of roll it backwards. So just like you had it on a videotape, and you started with that, and then you were just going to let the thing run backwards at the at the normal play thing, so you could kind of see how it happened. You could get it that way. You get to. Um, you, you get to specify the output of, of your intent. You know, how do you want the data? Okay, I intend to get this data, but how do you want it? You can roll the camera backwards. You can start back at a certain thing and then move forward. You can ask questions like, uh, I want to go back to the event that led to this perpetrator deciding on hurting this victim. I want to go back and start there. See, so that's not specifying a time or anything. It's specifying a, 
kind of a situation. And you could, you could start then at that point and go forward. So the, the, depending on what you want to do, you can, create, you can modify your tool set. Now, in as much as you get in a rut with a tool set, where you always approach everything in the same process, now you probably are creating inefficiencies for yourself because every case isn't the same. And if you understand really what's going on, then you can custom design your tool set to fit what it is you want to do and do it in a very, you know, uh, a very accurate and a very uh, efficient manner, which means you do it more quickly. Um, so that's, that's one thing, you know, that, that uh, one can do is just adjust your tools to fit the case. So you do go back in time and what you're getting, when I say it's in a database, okay, it's the, it's the uh, past database and that database is, a, is in terms of probability. So you can go back through that past database and say, I want just to see what's on our actual history thread, what actually happened, you know, what were the events that happened? You could, if you wanted to, for some reason, say, um, I'd like to see the third most probable thing that happened. You know, and now you get a different picture. Um, you can manipulate that however you want. You can say, I'd like to see the output like a movie. Or you can see the output in terms of feelings. Or in terms of uh, uh, signs, symbols. You know, things that you get, whatever you're used to, however you're used to dealing with the metaphors. You could, you could get smells, you know, that would kind of, that would connect you to that at that time. You can get the data you want. And the data, people think about a database, they think of a very sterile bunch of facts. All right, database would be who, what they look like, how tall they were, you know, the color of their hair, da da da, da just the facts, man. You know, they get all the, the, that kind of data, but that's not the way this database is. This database has everything in it, including emotion, feeling, um, ideas, thoughts, everything. You see, all the, all the things that define that person, every nuance. You know, it's not only that they had a blue and white striped shirt on, but what were they feeling? What were they thinking? What's, what was their emotional state? You know, the fear or the whatever. And you can follow those, that data. So when I say the database, it's not just an array of, of physical facts. It's all about... Consciousness this is a database that, that collects all the data and it collects it in terms of probability. So if you don't specify that, if you just say, I'm going to go back and, and see uh, what happened there, and you don't mention that it wants to be present, everything that actually did happen, the way it happened, when you just say, I want to see, you know, in your mind, you're kind of fuzzy about it, about what you're going to see, you know, you're kind of in the database and your mind is a little fuzzy. What happens, you may get in that part of the probable past that didn't happen, you see? And then you can run down some trail that actually goes nowhere because that didn't happen because you didn't specify just what you wanted. If, um, if your thoughts tend to meander around and the people who are good at this have learned to focus their mind, stay focused, clearly and without wavering around. But if your mind was to start jumping around at that time, you may have four or five different intents within two or three seconds. The mind works that way. You know, you're thinking this way, you're thinking that way. You're, you're kind of getting ahead of yourself. You're, you suddenly wonder about this idea, so now you have an intent about that before you've even digested the intent you just had. So your intent kind of jumps around because your mind jumps around because you're thinking about all kinds of possibilities. If you do that, and most people do, they're going to get a mishmash of stuff coming back from which you can learn probably nothing. So part of what these intuitives have learned to do is focus their mind, you know, very precisely. Not clutter it, not jump around, but look for certain things 
and keep that focus tight on what it is they want to know. But if they don't really understand that it's their intent that is the motive force here that's collecting the data, they may not be aware sometimes that, that their intent may not be perfectly clear. They may be thinking about, well, there's two or three ways I'd like to do this. And if they're thinking about all of them kind of together, they'll get a mishmash of all of those. They think maybe two or three things together is kind of their tent. Well, I'd like to get this and this and that. They'll get this and this and that, but it'll all be smushed together in a way that it's hard to pull it apart. You see, and you, you, it's easy to get confused that way. So the intent has to be precise. It has to be, you know, you almost have to think like a lawyer in the sense that you have to think in a way that's perfectly clear and can't be misconstrued or misunderstood. You have to know exactly what you want to see and the output you'd like to see it in. And then uh, you will get that information. These are the things that intuitives who are successful learn over the decades that they practice their art. They learn to make that intent clear and stable so it's not jumping around all the time. So why does the average person have problems doing this? Because their intent is not stable, not strong, not clear, not focused. Most of us don't have a focused intent for more than a couple of seconds at a time. That's why people have trouble meditating. The idea of sitting still and having no thoughts is very hard and only can last a few seconds because thoughts just intrude because that intent and that mind is hopping all over the place all the time consistently. And you can't uh, be successful at extracting data from these databases if your mind is, is skipping around you know, every few seconds, doing different things, intending different things, thinking different things, uh, going in and out of focus. Uh, that doesn't work very well. I think you said a couple of very interesting things and some very important point. Many of the psychics that I know um, deal with very strong emotions. They get very strong feelings of emotions. And you have said that, um, and I even had a, a note here on the emotions versus the database, but you very clearly place the emotions into that database as part of it. Sure. So these emotions that they are picking up on are actually part of the database sure. that you speak of. And exactly. That's very interesting. This is a database in consciousness. Emotions are part of consciousness. See, all, all facets of awareness are part of consciousness. This is a consciousness system database. This is not a physical matter reality, you know, virtual reality database. In our physical virtual reality database, there's nothing in it but physical data. How, how much does it weigh? What's its color? You know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All the physical facts is all there is. This is a consciousness database, not a physical virtual reality database. And it has all aspects of the consciousness, which include the emotions. Now, this also has an individual component. If what this, if an intuitive particularly relates to emotional information, then their intention will tend to pick out emotional information. If they particularly relate to physical fact information, they'll tend to get physical fact and as part of the query. You see, you have you have a very complex subject. You have the you know you have the hard physical facts. You've got emotional facts. You've you've got um, circumstantial things going on and all of this is dynamic it's all changing and if you know it's, it's something that you have to be very precise about or you'll get mishmashes of things now intuitives who are successful that do this in a long time they kind of know what works for them so they may particularly look for emotional connections because that's just the way they function it, it's kind of a a way they can interact and they get that emotional data and they practice at interpreting that and somebody else who wasn't practiced with that data probably wouldn't interpret it very well but somebody who works with the emotional data a lot then can get a lot of information out of interpreting that emotional data as you said previously how do you want the data so right. you can right that's part of the output what i want in an output 
is the feelings. I want the feelings of the of the uh, of the murderer and the feelings of the victim. You know, so you can get into the murderer's mind and see, well, that guy's nuts. You know, he's uh, his mind is is uh, not coherent. So now you know he's some kind of psycho. You know, driven because you get that kind of that kind of uh, emotional feeling from him, and you can tell that the victim is, you know frightened or scared or knows the person or doesn't know them, is surprised, and you get that kind of information and that will give you, get you clues. So if what you expect to get, you know, when you expect something, that really means it's, it's part of your intent to get that. If I expect that what I'm going to get when I query this database is the emotional information and that's part of my intent and that's what I'll get. So again, you fit the you can fit the query to suit the need. There may be some cases that an intuitive would go on that the emotional data is absolutely key to understanding what happened and why it happened and where the person might be. There may be other cases where that emotional data just isn't that significant. It's something else that's important, like in a kidnap victim. Where are they? Are they still alive? You know, and where are they being held? See, that would be the key thing, not so much the emotional state. It's a custom uh, process, which is why knowing how it works will help people customize the process to get the kind of information that they, that they need. So this database is a consciousness database, and sometimes people have this, this feeling of, if that's a database, you see, it, it's just somehow that's not real to them. Oh, it's just, you know, because I'll say, oh, it's just data. Well, the just doesn't mean it's not important, it's not significant, or it's somehow less than the real thing. And they'll say, well, when I'm a medium and I talk to, you know, I, I talk to Uncle Fred, who's your uncle, and I, I bring Uncle, up, uncle Fred up and I talk to him, that's the real Uncle Fred. And I can tell it's the real Uncle Fred because Uncle Fred will tell me things about what's going on now. See, present present things. We can talk even about future things. So it's not just data out of a database, but yes it is. You see, this database isn't like any database that you're thinking of. This is Uncle Fred as Uncle Fred was. And Uncle Fred, as he was, can make conversation about the present or the future as he was. Okay, well how does that work? Well, Uncle Fred, when he dies, doesn't just hang around waiting for people to call to talk to him. You know, plays his harp on the cloud waiting, waiting for the phone to ring to somebody, uh, you know, to, to ring him up and ask him a question. Uncle Fred moves on. He continues to evolve the quality of consciousness. That's what we do as consciousness. So we don't have one life and then hang around playing harp on the cloud waiting for the phone to ring in case somebody talks to us. And if we're off focused on some other Uncle Fred is now, uh, you know, <laughs> his name's now uh, Susie Smith, and he's, uh, you know, a two-year-old infant. Well, he's consumed in that, in that role, or maybe he's a teenager, you know, in another part of the world. He's consumed in that role. And Uncle Fred doesn't say, oh, somebody wants to talk to me. All right. I'm really the, you know, the original Uncle Fred, even though now I'm Susie Smith and I live in China and, uh, you know, my, my goat just died or something that's traumatic, you know, oh, but I got to go play the Uncle Fred role because, you know, and you've had, you know, 5,000 incarnations and now anybody calls, anybody rings on any of them, you got to run and, and play that role. It doesn't work like that. When it's done, it's done. So it is just a history database. But that database contains all the essence of Uncle Fred, including what Uncle Fred would probably say. Remember I said it was a probability model. What Uncle, Uncle Fred would probably say about the present and the future, as well as the past. So Uncle Fred's not stuck just in his past time. He can do whatever. It's a probability model. Now, what's the difference between this, this past uh, this past database and Uncle Fred when he was alive. There's only one small difference. Uncle Fred when he was alive was also 
a probability description of Uncle Fred. I mean, after all, we're consciousness. Consciousness is information. It's an information system, and it's, it's based on probability. So that's what Uncle Fred was when Uncle Fred was alive. He was consciousness, which is information, based on probability. That's what was making the choices. Okay, it was all of that data that was all of Uncle Fred's history from his first incarnation, you know, up to the thousand he's had since then, up to this present time, and now he's alive here. He's, he's the sum of all of that, of all the choices he's, he's ever made. And there are certain probabilities of the way he'll act, the things he'll say, and the way he'll say it, his accent, the kind of clothes he would wear. You know, does he have a great big, uh, you know, always wear a striped shirt, you know, and a hat with a, with a corn cob pipe, you know. Well, if that's the probable Uncle Fred, then that's the Uncle Fred you'll see. And he can discuss current events and his, his sense of the future, okay, because that's a probability of how he would react how that original Uncle Fred would react to that. So you get, you get an Uncle Fred that seems very real, who you can discuss most anything with, and that's the only difference between that, uh, that Uncle Fred that's in the database, that's just data, is that the Uncle Fred in the database is not making free will choices because this is the past, it's done. It's just a record of Uncle Fred's life as a consciousness, his feelings, his emotions, his thoughts, okay. his fears, his, his love, all of those things go together, including the way he thought, the way he did things, the probabilities that, that describe Uncle Fred are all there. But in the past database, it's just a potential Uncle Fred, okay? It's just, all the information that describes Uncle Fred, which is every choice he ever made up until the time he died, and, the, and all that stated in terms of probability, but he's not any longer making choices because this is, in, this is data in a database. Things in a database aren't making choices. He doesn't have free will. It's information in a probable setting. Okay, so the only difference between the real live Uncle Fred back before he died and this Uncle Fred is that this Uncle Fred that's in the database doesn't make choices. He's not continually to evolve himself in that role. He's now evolving himself as Susie Smith in China. See, he's got a different role that he's, that he's evolving himself that way. And we do that because if we just kept the same ID, if he was just Uncle Fred for 900 years, basically never died, or as soon as he died, he, he came back as the same person, Uncle Fred, looked the same, talked the same, still had the striped shirt, still had a corn cob pipe, you know, 10, ten uh, um, cycles later, 10 incarnations later, you know, he still got that shirt, he's still smoking that pipe, you know, he's still the same Uncle Fred. That would be, that would be limiting. It wouldn't have the, the, the set of experiences. It wouldn't have the growth potential. Uncle Fred needs to get out and do new things, see new perspectives, have new challenges, not carry around the baggage of his fears and, and his beliefs, you know, into the next one, into the next one. That's just a real recipe for slow growth. So the way the system works is, is that Uncle Fred just becomes data in the database. That free will awareness unit stops, it ends. It uploads all the information, you know, so that the system has a record of that, and then that entity, that uh, individual unit, unit of consciousness, goes on and takes another free will awareness unit in a different part of the simulation in the future. Well, that makes that very clear. Um, and the probabilistic answer from Uncle Fred is very understandable. What about the probabilistic answer versus a specific answer in the future. It wouldn't be a probabilistic answer from Uncle Fred, and that wouldn't be Uncle Fred. What would it then be? I'm not sure I, I got your question, but let me take a couple of stabs at it. Um, you know, Uncle Fred is, is history, as probability, that's preserved in a database. Okay. 
what he pro you know what he would probably say. So the system, you ask him a question, Uncle Fred, what do you think about you know, you know who should I vote for in the next election? This kind of thing. Well, you would have then a probability that would say what Uncle Fred would say about that. Well, that's from all the thoughts, all the feelings, all, everything that had been in his mind. So yes. it's just what Uncle Fred would think about it. And, he, and you would get that, and it would be very specific. Yes, you see, I it understand would, it would be that. Very, it would be very specific information. But now, here's another way to look at the problem. Okay, Who are we anyway? We're pieces of the larger consciousness system. That's what we are. You and I and Uncle Fred and, and these mediums, we're all people, I mean, we're all pieces of this larger conscious system. So what does that make us? That makes us a bunch of data, our choices, you know, all the feelings, all the choices we've made since we've started this, uh, you know, uh, incarnating and evolving our consciousness this way, that's made us what we are today. We're the sum of all those decisions and all those situations and all those choices. That's what we are, and this is data. And we are in a virtual reality, okay? Because we're in a virtual reality, we're interactive with others with a rule set. Because of that, we get to make choices with our free will. That evolves us further. Or if we make poor choices, that de-evolves us further. In any case, there we are. Okay, so we are information with a history. Okay, and that, that history then um, informs us as to our quality. See, we, we evolved a certain quality of our consciousness. That quality goes forward into the next incarnation. All the facts, all the physical facts of that incarnation stop because you don't want to carry all that baggage forward. So we, we are pieces of the larger consciousness system. We are subsets of consciousness, subsets of information. Data, probability, that's what we are. And if we're also in a virtual reality making choices, we have free will. If we are, if it's just past data, we're not in a virtual reality. We're data in a data file. We're data in a, in a database. We're not in a virtual reality and we're not making free will choices. But all of us, everything up to that point that defines us, we are still that. So let's say I go in and I talk to my Uncle Fred and, and we have some kind of conversation and the system, the larger consciousness system, feels like maybe I need a little something to help me grow. Maybe there'd be some connection, some information I need, something that would help me um, you know, deal with Uncle Fred's death or... Uh, you know, just be the right thing for me to get. You know how synchronicity works where you just get what you need when you need it. Well, this would be a way for the larger consciousness system to communicate to me. The larger consciousness system then would play the part of Uncle Fred and would deliver this information to me that I needed that would help me solve a problem or would help me see a bigger picture or would help me, you know, do something. So then I might get this information from Uncle Fred. Well, it's the larger consciousness system, if you will, playing through the interface of Uncle Fred and Uncle Fred's history and Uncle Fred's probabilities. You that see? is how Uncle Fred can answer in the present. Well, that's, that, that could be, Uncle Fred can answer in the present in two ways. One, you get a probable answer. This is what Uncle Fred would probably say. Okay, Uncle, Uncle Fred would probably say, you know, vote for so-and-so because Uncle Fred's been a Democrat for, you know, his whole life. And he'd, he'd tell you that because that's just what he'd say. That's the probable thing he'd say. So you get a, a, a voice, you get Uncle Fred, and he would tell you something about the future or what to do or being a present because that was the probability. And if you, if you wanted to know what was going on, you could say, I would like to get, I'm talking to Uncle Fred here, and I would like him to tell me the tenth most probable thing that he would say, rather than the most probable thing that he would say. So you can do both of those. You can say, first one, I, well, you know, the most probable thing, Uncle Fred, tell me who I should vote for, and then you could go back and repeat the experiment and say, I want tenth, okay, system, query, 
I want the tenth probable thing that he would say, the tenth most probable. And it could be the same thing because he may get, you know, there may be a whole lot of levels of his voting Democrat that he would say that, you know, at all levels of probability. But you get the point. You could say that and you get a different answer. You may get a different answer if, if really what he was saying wasn't something that was almost a probability of one, you know, if it was something that had more flexibility to it. So one way you get a, a direct answer from Uncle Fred in the present or in the future is it's probable. The system basically answers your query based on a probable answer. Now, the second way that you can get something from Uncle Fred is that you ask something that one, Uncle Fred really doesn't have maybe the experience to know. So he's kind of stuck for it because he doesn't have any probability that's too strong that really answers that question because maybe you're dealing in information that he didn't know anything about. Uh, it's not in his history. Well, in that case, the system can say, well, if he had this information, what would be probable? Again, you get probability. The system can say that. Or the larger consciousness system can say, I'd really like to help this person out. This person really needs to get over their, their grieving for Uncle Fred. So I need to tell them some things to help them deal with this. It really needs to you know, change their life and get serious here in some way. So the larger conscious system takes the opportunity to speak through the Uncle Fred interface to this individual, and it's really coming from the larger consciousness system. Now, the larger consciousness system will, you know, will use any interface that it can to connect with you and give you information that will help you succeed in your evolution. You know, you've probably heard me discuss this before. If you're very religious, you get religious figures that come and talk to you. If uh, you're not very religious, you don't get religious figures that come and talk to you. You will get what is most likely to work for you. All right, now, if Uncle Fred was your favorite uncle in the whole world and you and he were really close and you really trusted him and his vice was always really good, so that's a, that's a line that, that you trust and give a lot of credence to. And what you really need to know is to get up off your lazy butt and get to work. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. If that's the message you need, the larger consciousness system may just come through as Uncle Fred and tell you, you know, niece or... Nephew, you need to get off your lazy butt and get to work. Your problem is you're walling around in self-pity. You need to let that go. Get over it and go on, you see. And now you get this sage advice from Uncle Fred. And because it was Uncle Fred, you, it's good advice. It, you know, it hits you right. You get it. Whereas if it was a talking dog with two heads that told you that instead of Uncle Fred... If suddenly you saw this talking dog and they told you to, you know, get up and get going that you were in, in self-pity, you'd say, what was that? No way. You wouldn't take it seriously. You'd just think it was something quirky. It came out of your imagination. You wouldn't pay it any mind. Whereas Uncle Fred says it, you think about it. You see? So the larger consciousness system will use whatever tools it can to connect with you to help you do things. So that would be true... In the case of you, we've spoken about probability, which mm -hmm. is what which would be, what would be the probable answer? Right, Uncle Fred and you can give. get that answer if that works for you, and if that's good for you, then you'll get that's what you'll get first because that's the easiest thing for the system to do. But if the system would like to deliver a message to you or like to help you out, then it can directly talk to you through the Uncle Fred interface in the form of advice. In the form of advice, in the form of even facts. Listen, listen, Sonny, you know, uh, you know, when I was a young man, I hid uh, a whole bunch of gold under the floorboards of my bedroom back in the you know, east corner. Somebody needs to, you know, in, you know, you ought to go dig that up. Well, that may be something that uh, would really help. The larger conscious system may, may uh, believe that this person could really make use of some, of some resources, and that's a way of making that happen, you see? So it, it, there's, it's like anything that's complex. There's 10 different ways to skin the cat. There's 10 different ways to do something. And the system tends to pick what's most efficient and most helpful because 
your growth is its growth. As you lower your entropy, the system lowers its entropy. So the system wants you to succeed and will help you by giving you hints, if you will, and nudges to help you succeed. And if the way it can connect to you in a way that's likely to help you is by posing as Uncle Fred or as the angel Gabriel or as Mother Mary or as your mom, you know, or your dad or your favorite uh, pet, you know, if, if that's what works for you, then that is an interface that can be used. It's like your guides. Your guides are just another interface to the larger consciousness system. So the larger consciousness system gives you guidance through your guides because that's something you can connect to. Because if it doesn't come from, a, from kind of a person, you don't take it seriously. You say if it's a talking two-headed dog, if the, if the voice just comes out of the clouds, if uh, you know, it, uh, it's not somebody you know, it's just some stranger gives you advice, well, you're not too likely to take that. So you build up rapport with these guides and whatever, and you learn to trust them, and now that's a validated source that you can get information from. So it's just an interface. And you say, well, this larger conscious system seems to be in everybody's business. And well, yes, that's all we are. Who are we in this reality right now? Well, we are individuated units of consciousness who have put some of their energy into a free will awareness unit that is basically playing the role of an avatar in a virtual reality. Okay, and we are part of that larger conscious system. So you can think of it as the larger conscious system is playing our role through the interface of us. You see, so we're not any different. We're the, we, you know, me, Tom Campbell, and uh, you, Donna Veni, are interfaces for the larger conscious system to play through. We're players, right? Like the elf in World of Warcraft, you see? So we are all really pieces of this larger consciousness system. You and me and, and the larger consciousness system, if it can talk through our data set and interact in this world and make choices, it certainly can talk through you know, Uncle Fred's data set to give us a message. It's just, that's just the way the system works. Well, that answers the question. That answers the question past the probability answers, past the advice answers. It, it answers the question um, that psychics have often said, well, I got information. It has to be the real Uncle Fred because he told me my, you know, he told my client his grandson fell over on the bike yesterday. How is he? If that was just a database, how would he know that in the present? Sure. So that answers that too. Sure. That's one of the things they, they Sure. If you, if, if you, you know, if particularly, let's say the larger consciousness system would like you to understand a bigger picture and a bigger reality. So you've gone to this medium and you're talking to this medium and you're not so sure, you know, is this all a bunch of bogus baloney or not, right? And you, you know, you're only there because your friend, you know, you know, suggested you go and you thought you'd try it out. But it, it seems to you it's probably a lot of nonsense. Well, what the system can do to show you a bigger reality is tell you about somebody that fell over on a bike in your family. And now suddenly you go, I get it. <laughs> this is real. You know, this is not being made up. So is that good for you? Does that help you grow up? Sure, it shows you a whole bigger picture of what's going on. So the larger consciousness system would want to tell you that kind of thing. That would be a, you know, a thing it could do to aid you in seeing a bigger reality in a way that you couldn't just pass it off as luck or circumstance or lucky guess. So you'll get that. And what was the purpose of that? Not because you really needed to know about the child that fell off the bike. The purpose of that was to help you understand that reality is a lot bigger and more complex than you thought. And you need to take this a little more seriously. You see, instead of just blowing it off and going about, uh, you know, being focused only in the physical, 
Now you've just got something that was a wake-up call. Well, the system does that a lot. It gives wake-up calls all over to a lot of people, and over and over again, trying to wake them up. Doesn't always work, but that would be a reason of why the system would do that. Now, it also could be that you know the system has, it's a, it's a smart system. Obviously, the larger conscious system is a very intelligent, smart system. It created this virtual reality for us to play in. You can't do that. When I mean it created, it evolved it, but it, it created it. And you don't do that if you're slow-witted. Obviously, it's a smart system that, that really can handle a lot of data. So it could have said, well, given, you know, given what's going on now with this person and their family, what would be a probable thing for Uncle Fred to say? What would he be likely to say if he was talking to that person? Well, you could take some fresh data, you see, that happened after Uncle Fred died and include that in the database and then let Uncle Fred work on that with probability. That's a, you know, that's a possible way. More likely, it's just the larger consciousness system giving you something that you need to help you out, to um, you know, help you grow up. And one of the first steps in growing up is to realize that there's more to reality than just how much stuff you can buy and you know how much money you, you can get in the bank. That there's other dimensions here that are significant, and it can do that by that kind of a the kind of thing. So we're all pieces of this system. The system will use whatever interface works with us. And again, there's there's any any event could be two or three ways that it could happen. Some are more likely than others. You know, that's, you know, so that's how these things happen and, and why it seems so obvious that the Uncle Fred that the medium talks to is the real live awake Uncle Fred who's still with us and still knows that the little boy fell off the bike, you see, because it seems that way. Well, that's, that's the point, because it seems that way to you that's why when you get told something like that, it changes you. That person that got told that now is a different person because they can't say, oh, that was a lucky guess. That couldn't be a lucky guess. There's obviously something bigger going on here. There's obviously, we are something more than just physical bodies. Well, that's step one, you see. So that's, that's why and how those things, those things work like that. So yes, Uncle Fred is just data in a database but it's not data in a database like any database you've ever thought of before in your life. It's got everything in there, and it is equivalent to the live Uncle Fred while he was alive, except he's not playing in this virtual reality anymore, and because he's not in virtual reality, he's not making choices. He's not continuing to evolve Uncle Fred's consciousness. Uncle Fred's consciousness now is past. He's evolving Susie Smith's consciousness, which is now the same individuated unit of consciousness, doing something else with a whole clean slate, none of the baggage, starts over, different challenges, different ways, uh, no baggage, and uh, that's the way it, it needs to start. You see, you can't just have Uncle Fred going on and on and on forever because pretty soon he'd, he'd, he'd paint himself in a corner. He'd have so many beliefs and so many, you know, ideas about the way things he thought worked, so many problems, so much specific fears, you see, not just general fears at the being level, but very specific fears, that all that's baggage. You, you don't want to carry that from time to time to time, you know. He'd have so many relationships, so many thousands of children, so many thousands of wives and loved ones and nieces and, and nephews and parents by the thousands. How could he deal with all of that all the time because he you know, doesn't start over? It's impractical. If consciousness, if individuated units of consciousness are gonna learn in this learning lab, they get to a point where they just need to start over. Get rid of all the, all the junk they've accumulated and get a whole fresh viewpoint, a whole fresh set of circumstances in which to make choices in, because otherwise they're making the same old choices the same old way. They get in a rut and they don't learn much from that. 
So that's the, that's the point. And that's why that uh, you have to let go of the physical facts and old relationships. You let them go and you start with a new, with a new character, with a new avatar. And then you work, you know, you work with that. Well, you not only answered that question very well, but you have um, illustrated how your science ties into this, uh, this psychic, uh, these psychic abilities. And earlier you were speaking of psychic abilities and mentioned that everybody can do this. Um, one of Marla Free's comments was that people are walking around clueless about their power. What, what advice would you give to people on how to harness their power, perhaps, and to tap into this? Well, first of all, it's not about power. Marla's right. Most people are totally clueless that they are individuated units of consciousness, and because they're consciousness, they have a theoretical, anyway, ability to do a whole lot more than just access databases. You know, there's lots of things that they can do. They, they are basically free agents in the larger consciousness system because they are consciousness. And that gives them a lot of, of uh, power, if you will, to gather information, to understand things, to see different perspectives, to uh, do, do physics, do experiments, you know, in the larger consciousness system. There's just all sorts of things you can do. And they have this ability, but I say it's theoretical. Like I said, it's like you, you theoretically could be a top-notch concert pianist, theoretically. There's no reason, as long as you've got f five fingers and a, you know, and, a, and a brain and arms that move and so on, you could learn to play the piano. So, but that's all theoretical. To make that an actuality, you actually have to sit down and practice four or five hours a day every day for a decade. And probably if you want to be a top-notch pianist, you probably have to practice for two or three decades, or four decades. Anyway, she's right. Most people do not understand the nature of consciousness, nor uh, the, she uses the word power, that, that you, you have, the things that you can do, the, the access that you have, they don't understand. Now, if the reason that they would want to grow up and lower their entry is because, gee, I want all that neat power. I want to be able to do those things. You know, the, the funny example I use is I want a remote view into the girls' locker room. You know, that's why I want, that's why I want uh, you know, to do these things is because there's some advantage. I want to read numbers in the lottery. This is cool. I want to look and see what my kids are doing when they're away from home. So if you have these ego and fear-based things, then that's the wrong reason. It's the wrong intent for doing this. So if it's power you're after, you probably won't get much of it and you'll probably be frustrated because you will be your own worst enemy. Your own fear and your own ego will constantly get in the way of developing this power that you lust after. So for one, yes, everybody has the potential to be able to do what humans can do, what Marla Fries can do. The potential's there, but most of them don't develop it. And the idea isn't to say, oh, I'm going to go out and start practicing and developing, you know, my skills of reading the databases. You can do that. And to some extent, you will be successful, but not nearly so successful as you would be if what you said, what I'm, what I'm going to do is going to grow up. I'm going to let go of fear. I'm going to let go of ego. I'm going to care. I'm going to be compassionate. In other words, lower your own entropy, grow the quality of your consciousness, and then your ability to use these databases as well as lots of other stuff that's available to you will just be there. You see, you will, you will have these abilities if you wish to practice them. It won't be the great struggle that frustrates you. The reason that you get frustrated in this great struggle, you want these abilities and can't seem to make them work very well is because you are blocking yourself, you're getting in the way. The fear and ego is the, is the problem. So first start with, I want to grow up, work on that, 
And as you work on that, you can practice these things. So you too can be intuitive and sensitive to these things. You too can control your mind so that you can, you can hold a, a, a clear, um, accurate focus for a long time. So that's the thing. I don't want the idea, yeah, these are powers and all of you could go out and get these powers, you know, you should do it. It's a great way to control your children. You know, that's not the right reason. You need to do it because it's available to you because you've grown up. So don't be out searching and seeking for the power. Well, I think Marla, of course, we know Marla meant power I'm, in the most. Yes, as I know. Mar nature. Marla wasn't. She meant it in the best possible. She wasn't way. telling people it's, to go out and seek power. No, I, I just. They're just to recognize their true nature. Exactly. And harness. I know that's what she meant. Yeah. I just didn't want my words to trigger people into a into a let's go get some power thing. Of course, of course. So that's why I say that. No, Marla, I agree with Marla entirely. People don't know, and if they did know, it may spur many of them to begin the growth process with earnestness rather than just kind of stumbling around and, and not really getting anywhere very fast. So in that sense, the, the uh, psychic phenomena are sort of like the, uh, the bright, colorful flowers that attract the bee. A lot of people get into spirituality and get into uh, studying consciousness and meditating because they are drawn to those pretty attractive flowers, which are the psychic phenomena. They want to experience that. They want to be able to do that. But it, that's fine. But you have to convert that interest eventually into focused on growing up and the psychic phenomena become secondary. It's like, uh, you know, collateral uh, advantages in order to go very far with it. But it's an, it is initial, uh, an initial draw these these powers, but I know what Marlon meant, and she's she's absolutely correct. And people just don't know what they are, that they are consciousness. They think they're a body, and they're not. Well, another dear friend of ours contributed and has uh, a question for you. Hilary Ramo is another uh, talented, intuitive author and talk show host. Hilary says that. She knows your language well, and one of the things that she's noticed that you speak in a very scientific way, and this is just what we are, just what we are talking about, the science versus the um, psychic phenomena, and how they can blend together, how they can evolve. Uh, most men relate to science too. This is, um, this speaks well to the engineers and information technology and physicists, persons, and, and, and lawyers. You know, it's it's not just all technical sure people, but <laughs> people who do logical process for a living. Yes, yes. Um, in the intuitive world, that language doesn't always translate it well. The feminine translation is often worded differently, although in essence it means the same thing. She would ask, how do you feel about the approach in translation when it comes to the male versus female perspective? You know, you hear always feminine intuition and science is male. So, um, since often intuition is associated with the feminine and intuitive mind in both men and, men and women, how would you approach? Um, so, is, yeah, I think it's a matter of, of uh, how do you teach? different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And she breaks it up to two different kinds of people are male and female. But I don't think that's really the best way to uh, divide up this problem. It's not just in the male and female. I think it's a more accurate to say that people who, who approach life with logical process, which would be what would be traditionally called left brain people, if left brain people um, look at my big toe, they like the logical process. And I get as many email from females that say, I've been searching for something like this, you know, for 20 years and wow, thanks. This really 
hits the spot that this makes good sense to me. I get as many females that send that kind of a letter to me as I get males. Because there's a lot of females in our culture that also do logical process. It's not just the males. Now, it is probably true that a larger percentage of males are left brain and a larger percentage of females are right brain. Okay, so the females you may get a, you know, a, a 25% are right brained and in males you may only get 20% or 15% that are right brained. So there may be a little uh, uh, sexual uh, correlation between being left brain and right brain, and I suspect that that correlation is what uh, Hillary is, is noticing and talking about that she notices that the kind of men get it, but women don't get it from the intuitive side. But I don't think it's really a, a male-female issue as it is a left brain, right brain. So if you happen to be a female lawyer and what you do for a living is logical process, then my big toe will speak to you. If you're male and right brained and what you, you don't do logical process, you do right brained intuitive holistic process, you don't have to get there step by step by step. You just intuit. You get there because you know that's right. You couldn't tell anybody else why that was right. You're not very convincing, but you know that it's right because you write brain and you think in big picture terms, not in little step logical process terms. Well, whether you're male or female, you'll find my big toe will be a little difficult, a little rough going because it's a logical process. And it's that way on purpose for several reasons. One, I'm a scientist. Logical process is what I do. And I wanted to write my, my big toe in logical process terms because those kinds of people now don't have an on-ramp to the bigger picture. Because if they uh, look at the um, you know, um, metaphysical literature, they look at the spiritual literature, they look at that and they shake their head and they say, that doesn't make sense and they don't go there. Now the people who are, who are right-brained, the people who are intuitive, they have thousands of books, thousands of, of places that they can go to connect to the metaphysical and the spiritual, and it all seems obvious and trivial to them and they get it right away. You see, they've got lots of on-ramps to get there. So my book is primarily focused at the logical process folks men and women, and that, I think, is the difference. So women who are, who, women or men who are particularly intuitive probably struggle with it and don't f find it to be a lot of trouble. It's like, why do you want to take, you know, 200 tiny steps, you know, to get from A to B when it's so obvious, <laughs> you know, that you're A and now you're at B. You don't need all those little logical steps in the process. And it seems like to go through all of that is painful, repetitious, and unnecessary. So they tend to not like, you know, my books or, or stuff very much. They find it kind of tedious to go through all those steps when you can just skip them all and get to the answer. But the trouble is, of course, when you get to the answer intuitively, you're never quite sure whether that really is the answer or whether you just think that's the answer. So intuitives have to do a lot of practicing and testing and kind of research with their talents before they learn to be confident of what they're getting and how they're getting it. And that takes decades to do that. When you logical process things, you don't have that problem. You know that when you get from A to B that that's right, that, that what, you, what you got at B is correct because you've got the logical process that takes you there. Now it's not a intuitive result, it's a logical result, which um, gives you confidence that it's correct. So there's, a, there's an interplay between those two. And now, because you took the logical process, you can explain it to somebody else. And if somebody else says, oh, you're an airhead, you go, Pfft, I've, I've gone through it. I've done the math, you know, I, I know how this comes out. And you're not, uh, you know, those kinds of things don't, don't affect you because you've, you've gotten there. So there's advantages and disadvantages of being either right or left brain dominant. 
So that's what I would say. I don't think it's really a, a male and female, but that does challenge me to speak in ways and use terminology that the right brain people can process. And I try to do that because I have people of all types. I probably get as many right brain people in my, in my uh, workshops as I have left brain people in the workshops because they're the ones that look at it right away and they say, oh, it looks like there might be something here I'd be interested in. You see, whereas most of the left brain people would look at a, a little blurb on my big toe and I say, oh, it sounds like a bunch of, you know, a bunch of nonsense. So I get a lot of right brain people and I try to, to give them things that they can use. But basically and fundamentally, my big toe is specifically aimed at the, at the left brain because they need it. And they, in general, are the movers and shakers of our culture. So those are the people that uh, make decisions that affect all the rest of us for the most part and uh, that's where I'd like to, to uh, make a big impact. Again, I think the, you know, our, our high priests of our culture are the scientists and until the scientists get this, then it'll probably stay relegated to the margins. And if I'm going to talk to the scientists, I'm going to get the high priests to uh, step up to a bigger reality then I'm going to have to talk in their language, which is logical process. Otherwise, I'd just be, uh, uh, you know, ignored without a, without a look. I'd probably get that, you know, for most scientists anyway, but at least if they uh, give it a try, then they'll find logical process. I do think that Hillary alluded at the right brain and left brain thing, um, but also going further, um, how would you say men and women, since the female intuitive mind is what we tend to think of as female, female in, intuition, how might men and women translate intuitive information differently? How, well, how would we say well, women, how tend, we women tend to live in bigger pictures in some ways. It's just the nature of what they do. When you are a woman, let's say, let's go back, uh, you know, a hundred thousand years when we were, you know, in caves and so on. You know, a woman has to do a lot of things at once. Women are much better at parallel processing for this reason. You you often can go into a business and you'll run into a secretary in there who's at the reception desk. She's talking on the phone this way and at the same time she's the other hand is doing something else she's looking up information on the computer and in between sentences on the phone she's talking to you and who knows she may be doing her nails at the same time but that's parallel processing and women do that better than men men tend to be focused one track they get focused on something they're more deeply focused on that thing and everything else going on in the world tends to just disappear because they're focused on that one thing. We tend to be uh, not so good at parallel processing. Now, men can learn to parallel process and women can learn to focus. I'm not saying that, you know, that's not the case. It's just we have a, it's more natural for the, for the ladies to parallel process. That's because they're working in a bigger picture. They've got kids to take care of. They've got other things to do. They've, they're taking care of of you know their households, their children, their men, their connections with other women, their their culture, they're the kind of the glue that that uh, holds the culture together. So that's you know that kind of thinking tends to have you out doing multiple things. It's not so much a fact-based thing as it is a as it is a, a knowing, an intuition-based thing. Relationship is not a fact-based thing. Relationship is often about feeling, connections, slight clues that you interpret. It's got a lot of interpretation going on, and women spend a lot of their time focused on relationship. Men are out in the outer world doing things, building things. If you're going to build something, if you're going to build a, a bus, that takes a lot of detail. You can't do that and have your mind 
going four or five different ways all at once, you have to know that there's 10,000 parts in that bus and every one of them has to be exactly right and they all have to fit together exactly so or it doesn't work. So it's a very focused in kind of thing. So the, the, uh, that's why you have a dichotomy there between the, and we, the male and female. And, and uh, we tend to think, oh, women are intuitive and men aren't. Well, not really so as far as capability. Men are capable of being intuitive as well. And women are capable of being logical, you know, logically processing as well. It's just that women tend have evolved to have a more intuitive connection with things because they deal primarily with relationship. And men have more of a logical process slant on things because they tend to deal with you know, the, you know, the security and the construction and, and the, uh, the outside world details. So anyhow, that's why we talk about women's intuition. We don't talk about men's intuition. Now, partly the women, with all that practice, because they do multiple things, because they have a lot, a lot of things to juggle at the same time. Children are very demanding, and the demands are constant and always. And besides doing children, there's four or five other things that need to get done at the same time. So women, because they practice more with that sort of thing in relationship, get to trust it more. Get to, they pay attention to it more. They understand that the information they get sometimes is good and sometimes not, and then they, they learn how is it that they get it that it's better. So they evolve this quality. It gets better with time because they experience it more, whereas men don't do it so much. So they're not too sure about this intuition thing. Could they trust it? Eh, I don't know. Sometimes they get an intuition, gut feelings, and that works, and sometimes it doesn't. And it's just not so trustworthy a thing because they don't have as much experience with it. But, in, but the intuition is not a female attribute. They just have a proclivity. They do it more. And it's probably an, an easier thing to grow because they, they're forced to do it in, in their relationship roles. Men can do that. Now, I started life mainly as being intuitive. I was much more right brain when I came into this world. I was a very right brain kid, very holistic. I got big pictures. I saw connections between things, and I wasn't all that reliable with a logical process. But I knew I had to develop the other side. So because I had to develop that other side, I started pushing myself, forcing myself to do logical process. And what's the, <laughs> the best track you can possibly do to make yourself do logical process, it's mathematics and physics. That is kind of the, you know, the king of logical process, where that's all it is. It's, it's logical process. Math is logical process. Physics is logical process, and that's basically all it is. It's logical process. So I did that to develop that, and now I am a very intuitive, very right brain person, and I'm also a very uh, left brain uh, logical process person. I do both, and I do both probably to an extreme. I'm extremely right brain and extremely left brain at the same time. I just call that being whole, whole brain. So anybody can be both. And. Um, you know, these are these are skills that one can that one can develop and learn with time. The women develop and learn it, and it's part of their it's part of their pre-programming. They come in that way to some extent because that's over thousands of years they've evolved to have to parallel process in their relationship functions, which are their main functions. How might a male or an and female interpret? Could you give an example how they might interpret the same intuitive information? Oh, well, would you want to give me an example of intuitive information to work on? Or? Something, some um, precognitive information, something... Um, some precognitive, let's say a precognitive dream. Something like that. Let's say they have a precognitive dream. Okay. Okay, or they just get a really strong feeling about the way something might work. Okay. Because a woman knows that, has experience 
that these feelings often pan out because they pan out in her relationship. She's got relationships with dozens of people and a lot of the way she interacts has to do with feeling and intuition. And she has practiced it enough that she's pretty good at it. She gets that feeling. She's more likely to pay attention to it. She's more likely to say, mm, I got this bad feeling about such and such. I need to be really careful. Maybe I won't do that today. Or if I do, I really need to pay attention because there's something maybe is not going to work here. And I'm going to be particularly vigilant about not letting anything get out of hand. Whereas the guy, he gets that dream. He gets that feeling. And he says, well, uh, nonsense. And he forgets about it and goes on about his job or goes on about his work because he doesn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Or if he does pay a little attention to it, it's kind of in the back of his mind, but he's not really particularly vigilant, you see. And that would probably be the difference. And that's just because one of them's used to dealing with that and takes it more seriously. The other isn't used to doing That's not his mainstay. He doesn't do relationships all day. He does stuff all day. He works with stuff. And she works doing relationships for the most part. Now, yes, he has relationships. He has his boss and his co-workers and that, but that's not the key thing, you see. Now, for the lady in that same job, that is the key thing. That's one of the key things, is working that networking, those relationships. The guy is focused on his nuts and bolts and building his bus and you know his job that he has to do. And he lets all that relationship just kind of flow by him and he does what he needs to do and he stumbles through relationships mostly, clueless. And uh, that's you know, kind of the way it is. So I'd say he would probably uh, maybe think about it for a few seconds and then let it go. She would take it more seriously. So that would be a difference in how they'd perceive the same information. Now, if the information was outside logical process, you see the opposite would happen. He would take that more seriously and think about it and you know, work with that. That would be more important to him. And she was more likely to think about it a little bit and say, uh, yeah, okay, and then forget about it and let it go. So it's not, you know, there's a, there's a symmetry there. There's things that, that uh, the logical process is a little more into his working with the stuff, which is what most males do uh, they're they're uh, hardwire programming, if you will. That's what they do. They're out, uh, you know, planning the next battle and catching the rabbits, and that's stuff based, not relationship based. And the ladies are back in the cave, uh, taking care of you know, bunches of children and and doing all the other chores that they have to get done. And they only get that done by networking and relationships with other people, particularly other other females. So. Yeah, it's just a little difference in their nature and the way they the way they approach things. So the guys will jump on logical process and and jug jug on it, and the ladies generally find it not quite so intriguing or demanding or whatever. They they're likely to kind of let that go because they that's not the way they process their world so much. All right, thank you for that. Laurie Houston also contributed to this to this subject. She's, uh, her website is Intuitive Soul and she's a very talented um, psychic from Canada. And she's done a lot of interviews with you. She says, um, I miss doing shows with you. We'll have to do some more. Um, what she did comment on, we always brought his work back to love that is the connection of data and our gifts. We receive the data at all times. It's how we interpret the data. If we have fear, the data is misinterpreted. If we come from love, whatever way we receive the data, which is always streaming to us, it has a better chance of being interpreted correctly. Data is consciousness, and we filter it based on our state of being. Well, thank you for that, Laurie, um, for graciously sharing this experience with us. Could you comment on that? Sure, sure. Yeah, Lori and I have probably done dozens of, of interviews and, and talks. And you can find them all on Lori's uh, uh, webpage. Intuitive Soul. Intuitive Soul, yeah. So we, there's lots of uh, interviews we've done. And anyway, she's right. Uh, she understands it very well from what she just expressed, what she read. And 
we do always end up, you know, we'll start at some sort of uh, phenomena. She'll, she will often talk about something that uh, she's experienced, something she's observed. Well, you know, I observe people and I find them like this, and here's the problems that they're having. So she starts with some sort of observed things, and we talk about it, and we talk about the problems and, and how to deal with those, and what's, what's, it, you know, what's the solution, how do you solve those problems. And, of course, it always boils down to the same thing, because this theory of mine is very simple when it comes to consciousness, as far as its motivation and its, its uh, you say, its purpose and its point, and that is, no matter what the problems are we talk about, and we come at it from all sorts of different problems and different angles, but it always turns out that the problem is fear, fear creating ego and belief, expectation, you know, the wants, needs, desires, I, 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 that, that kind of thing, that's where the problem comes from. One seeing oneself at the center of the universe. One seeing oneself in terms of what I can get, what I need, and how can I keep it, as opposed to what can I give, how can I help, how can I serve. So that's the problem, and the solution is always the same, and that is grow up. Let go of the fear, get rid of the ego and the expectations, become love. So she's right. Whatever problem you start with, from whatever angle you start with, you know, viewing that problem, whatever your perspective is, you will find that if you dig deep enough, the problem is fear. And if you dig deep enough, you'll find that the solution is love. So she's right. We started in, you know, a dozen different different uh, subjects, and it always goes back to fear's the problem, love's the answer. And that's just the way it is. And the reason it's that way is because in the larger consciousness system, our purpose here is to evolve the quality of our consciousness. And we're put in this virtual reality with an avatar, so we get to make decisions, make choices, make decisions, make choices. Uh, because we're in this virtual reality, we have choices to make, we have free will, we're conscious, that's what we're here for. And as we grow up, that means lowering our entropy. We do that by becoming love. Fear is a very high entropy thing. And love is a very low entropy thing. And that's a whole different question. I've discussed that before, so I won't go into it now. But that's our purpose here. So here we are in a learning lab trying to evolve the quality of our consciousness by letting go fear and becoming love. That's our job. That's what we do. That's why we exist. That's why we're a piece of the larger consciousness system. So the problems that we're having, the things that make us miserable, the things that make us unhappy, the things that uh, cause us grief is our fear. And the things that make joy in our life, the things that give us pleasure and, and progress, is our love. So that's just the nature of the system that we're in. We're here to grow up, which means we're here to become love, and fear is the opposite of love. So all the problems, all the issues, all the negativity, all the heartache and frustration, all the sadness, all boils down to... Let go of the fear, become love, and your life will be wonderful. It will be a whole lot better, and your problems will go away. Because most of your problems are self-made and have to do with your fear, your ego. So that's, that's why she's absolutely right. And she noticed that. She mentioned it a couple of times. She says, we always end up with the same answer. And I said, yeah, I hate to be redundant, but that is the answer. So you, you come up with a problem, and if it's a problem here that people are having, that's the reason why they're having the problem, and that's the solution to the problem that they're having. Of course, you can apply those very general ideas in lots of different ways, but that's just the way it works out. So, yeah, Lori's a, a good interviewer. We have a lot of fun on our, She's lovely. On our talks. Yeah. And thank you to all of our talented psychics who contributed to the 
uh, questions and statements in this interview, and thank you to Tom. Uh, hopefully this is helpful to other psychics and mediums and helpful in evolving their gifts. Thank you, Donna. It's been fun, Thank you. as usual. <laughs>